Aloha, and thank you for joining us on the Heat Beneath Our Feet webinar, a webinar series that will accompany this year's WGA Chairman Initiative, selected by Colorado Governor Jared Polis to explore the development and deployment of geothermal energy. I'd like to start off by extending our gratitude to Governor David Ige of Hawaii for inviting us out to tour his state's geothermal resources. On October 9th, WGA was joined by Governor Ige as we visited Volcanoes National Park, Puna Geothermal Venture, and the Blue Planet Research Lab. We are joined by representatives from federal and state agencies, private industry, and academic institutions who participated in a work session to discuss the opportunities and challenges with the development and deployment of geothermal resources, specifically geothermal electric generation. Thank you to the teams of the National Park Service, ORMAT Technologies, and the Blue Planet Research Lab, and the state of Hawaii who made these tours possible. And before going further, I'd like to take a moment to recognize our sponsors who are listed at the beginning of this webinar. This support, their support is what makes our work on this initiative possible. Today, we have three great guests joining us to discuss geothermal energy. First, I'd like to introduce Scott Glenn, the Chief Energy Officer of the Hawaii State Energy Office. Scott, can you wave and introduce yourself? Awesome. Also from Hawaii, I'd like to in introduce Nicole Lautze, an Associate Specialist Faculty at the University of Hawaii Manoa School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology. Nicole, can you wave? And did I get that right? It's actually a full, full specialist, but all good. I apologize. <laughs> and finally, we're joined by Paul Thompson, Vice President of Business Development at ORMAT Technologies, the operator of Puna Geothermal Venture. Throughout this webinar, if you'd like to ask any questions, please submit them in the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen for our Q&A section of this webinar. To kick off the discussion, I want to hand the mic over to Scott Glenn, the Chief Energy Officer of Hawaii State Energy Office, uh, to give us an overview of Hawaii's climate-related goals and how geothermal resources can help Hawaii meet those goals. Scott, the mic is yours. Thank you, Steve. Um, I'm going to share a screen, so please let me know if uh, this is coming through. Are you able to see it? Yep. Great. Thank you. Um, I want to extend thanks to, to uh, Western Governors Asso Association and Governor Polis for um, coming out to Hawaii to look at our uh, geothermal experience on Hawaii Island. Um, we really appreciate it hosting everyone and understand that it can be a, it can be a big commitment to come out to Hawaii. So uh, again, thank you uh, for your attention and the opportunity to share our story with the Western Governors Association. Um, I'm going to give an overview of Hawaii's climate and energy policy in our situation to help set the context for uh, the heat beneath our feet and the way it can be a part of Hawaii's clean energy economy. Um, so starting off, our, our role as the State Energy Office is to promote energy efficiency, renewable energy, and clean transportation. We touch all three of those with the idea that we're moving the entire economy forward to be resilient and clean energy. And I'm going to show some slides that will have a lot of text on them, but I'm not going to read them. So. Uh, I, you know, people can come back and look in more detail at the text if they'd like. Um, the twin pillars of Hawaii's uh, clean energy and climate policy are our renewable portfolio standard and our net negative emissions target. So for the renewable portfolio standard, Hawaii was the first state in the country to commit to 100% renewable energy. Um, what I'm showing on the slide here are the targets and milestones um, by date. And just to note that this year, we actually raised the bar further on ourselves um, by changing our standard from net sales to generation for renewable energy generation for our renewable portfolio standard. So going forward, when we reach 100%, it will actually be 100%. We also have the zero emissions clean economy target. This is something that we passed in 2018. It's often called carbon neutral or zero emissions, but when you read the text, which I've highlighted in orange here, really our target is to be net negative. It's to sequester more greenhouse gases than we release as quickly as practicable. This year, 2022, our legislature also added a 2030 interim target. They moved our baseline from 1990 to 2005 and directed the state to uh, reduce our emissions to less than 50% of our 2005 emissions. 
So we're now working on that as our 2030 target on our way to becoming net negative. Um, why are we doing this? Well, it's because Hawaii is the most oil dependent state in the country for all of our energy needs. And so this is a breakdown of the barrel of oil. You can see that electric power is about a quarter of it. Um, but you can also see that transportation um, is very oil dependent. And if you take a look at our entire energy system, this is a Sankey diagram. Um, for those who aren't familiar with them, it's a really useful tool for seeing how energy moves through an economy. You can map the, uh, that barrel of oil down here over petroleum and see how it breaks out into our energy system. So you can see geothermal is a very small amount. And by the way, these units are in BTUs, not megawatts. Um, so that makes it a, a comparable number across all of the forms of energy. Um, coal, by the way, is over. So the 2022 chart for Hawaii will no longer show coal. Um, we retired our last coal plant in September. Um, what you can see, though, is electricity generation is a big part of our energy mix, but transportation is an even larger part of it. And so I'm going to touch a little bit on what I think uh, geothermal could also play a role in our transportation space, too, here in a moment. But to focus on electricity, um, we are... Um, or I'm sorry, to, to focus on our emission side. So that was the energy picture for the emissions in the state. Most of our emissions are energy related. About 85% of emissions in the state are, are coming from the energy sector. And on this, on that bar chart, that red part at the bottom, that's our sinks. And so by 2045, that red bar down there needs to be larger than the bars above the zero line. That's how we know we're net negative. So um, when you break up the energy emissions, you can break it up roughly into two buckets of power and transportation. Um, but notice that again, transportation is the larger um, source of emissions and that can be broken up into aviation, ground, which is gasoline and diesel for trucks, cars. Um, and, but so within, within that, um, we are now you know, making progress on our renewable energy goals. And so we've been able to decrease our emissions. That's why the power sector emissions are lower than transportation, is because we are moving quickly toward renewable energy. And so this is using electricity sales. What you're seeing here is as a state, we're at 40% as of last year, 2021. And on the right-hand side, you can see the distribution of our renewable energy sources. And geothermal is about 2.1% of total state renewable energy net sales. Um, however, this is not evenly distributed across the state. So, um, but before I get into that, I just want to show that the progress we've made since establishing the 100% target in 2015, we've, we've almost doubled the renewable energy in Hawaii across the state in eight years. So if you see up there the 2030 target of 40%, we're already there based on the net sales target. So we've already achieved our 2030 goal that we set for ourselves seven years ago. And what you'll see here is that islands like Kauai have already achieved the 2040 goal. And Hawaii Island is well on its way to achieving the 2040 goal as well. So while we do have road bumps on individual projects as a state overall, we are far exceeding the progress on our RPS than what we thought we could achieve in 2015. And I think Nicole and Paul will talk a little bit more about geothermal's role in that and how we can see us getting even further progress with it. Um, and I highlighted on this slide, the one place we do have geothermal for power is Hawaii Island, and it contributes about 18% of the, of the island's total energy for electricity. Um, another look across the state and something for, I think, our audience to be aware of is that Hawaii is a state of islands with six standalone grids. So all of the electricity that's used on one island is made on that island, either from burning fossil fuels and power plants or from the renewable energy that's made on that island. Uh, we do not have any cables. We don't have any really other form of moving energy between the islands except as fossil fuels right now, um, which might be something geothermal can help out with in the future, which I'll come back to. Um, but I just want to also highlight that of the islands, Oahu is not the largest, in terms of land size, but it is the center of demand. The population and the megawatts for our peak are all basically on Oahu. Um, Hawaii Island is a, uh, where our geothermal power plant is, 
um, has a much more manageable grid size. Um, but really the demand center for the state is on Oahu. And so one of our biggest challenges will be, how do we get that island to 100%? Um, and what are the opportunities there that we might be able to see for geothermal? Um, one, of the, one of the benefits of this, we're undergoing a natural experiment right now on uh, oil prices. So with the invasion of Ukraine, we've seen global oil prices go crazy, basically. Um, and so what we're seeing is that the more one of our islands has pursued renewable energy, the less exposure it has to price increases. Um, although Hawaii Island at the second highest amount of renewable energy still has a high degree of, of exposure to oil, and that's partly because of the contracts that are in place. And so one of the things we're really excited about what uh, PGV is working on and that Paul will probably speak more about is the change in the contract that they're working on with our Public Utilities Commission. Um, but what we've seen is that Kauai, which is at 70% renewable energy um, and has basically fixed prices in their contracts, is showing us that they are plateauing in terms of price increases as the global oil markets increase and have extreme volatility. And it really becomes apparent when you look at the month over month percent changes in electricity bills where you can see that basically Kauai has stayed stable throughout the last year and a half, while every other island's electricity rates have increased. And that's because of their higher exposure to oil. And in Hawaii Island's case, some of the older uh, contract terms that they have. And so again, we're really excited to see those get updated because we think it'll be a direct benefit, especially to low-income people, people who live on fixed incomes, to be able to have predictable, stable electricity prices. And, reasons to get off of fossil fuels is to get away from that volatility. Um, and just underscore too, our, our dependence, our oil um, in Hawaii generally comes from, you know, countries we have concerns about. And so prior to the uh, invasion of Ukraine, as much as 50% in some years of our oil came from Russia. And so, you know, that has stopped now. Uh, there's no guarantee that that will stay stopped. We hope it will. Um, and we've mainly shifted our oil importing to Libya and Argentina. Um, and that's for a number of reasons not to get into here, but just to highlight that we don't, as a state and a country, want to be depending on Russia or some of these other countries for our oil. Um, I just want to take a moment to highlight, too, on the negative side, that we are, in terms of our climate goals, looking at nature-based solutions and how we can work with trees. Um, and having trees help sequester CO2 to get to negative emissions. Um, but I don't think that's going to be enough. And I think one of the things that we're really looking at here um, is an example from Iceland, where they have a geothermal power plant paired with a direct air capture plant. And we have an example of an actual net negative power plant. And so what our understanding in our dialogue with Iceland is that they have a geology and resource mix that's similar to Hawaii's. And so we might be also able to do something like that where we can pair something like geothermal with um, direct air capture. So in thinking about, and just to wrap up here, um, thinking about some of the opportunities that the heat beneath our feet can provide to our clean energy economy. One is electricity, uh, renewable electricity for stable prices. Um, and, and also basically, full-time around-the-clock power. Uh, also, I think geothermal has the potential for helping us with our transportation issues, um, both in form of being able to be cheap enough to be produced to become hydrogen for shipping between the islands, or also as an electrofuel for in the future when we get to hydrogen buses or um, aviation. Um, and then lastly, also to help drive our negative emissions goals to help power direct air capture or some of these other really innovative cutting edge technologies that are very expensive right now, but with the low, low price that geothermal can offer uh, makes them much more viable and puts them on the table. I think as a state, one of our big uh, challenges and efforts going forward will be having the community dialogue and education um, to help folks understand what is this potential for the state, how it can address some of the other challenges we're living with. Um, and then from there, what are the ways that we can pursue this in a way that our communities can feel proud 
and glad to have this be a part of our lives and our fabric of our economy here. Um, with that, I'll wrap up and thank you again, Steve, for the opportunity to share this. Absolutely, and thank you, Scott, for joining us today. Just a reminder to those who are tuning in, if you'd like to ask a question, please put it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will make sure to ask those during the Q&A session at the end of our presentations. We're now headed over to Nicole Lautze. Uh, Nicole, you are quite literally an expert on the heat beneath Hawaii. What can you tell us about this amazing resource and the very unique geology that Hawaii possesses? Yeah, thanks, Stephen, for the invite to present um, today in this webinar. And Scott, that was a perfect kind of kickoff to what I'm going to present. I'm a geologist by training, and so I'm going to get kind of a lot more into the nitty gritty about what we currently know about the state of Hawaii's resource. And so as you can see in the top right, we are an ocean island hotspot um, that exists because there is magma. We like to think of it as stationary magma body, and the Pacific plate moves to the northwest over that hot spot of magma. And so volcanically, the islands get older to the northwest. But our volcanoes do some kind of fluky things. So we have these later stage rejuvenation volcanics um, on Oahu and Kauai that could be relevant to geothermal resources on those islands. Oops. Um, one thing that's challenging about our resource is that yeah, it's blind yeah. and it's deep. I wonder so what that temperature in California is. In Iceland, where there's surface manifestations of heat, in Hawaii, we don't have that. Another have one no right over there. No hot springs. In there. And there's a um, so we need to plant. kind of think about where there is magma movement in the subsurface, and we want to find that uninterrupted or intrusive magma. And so the cartoon that you see at the bottom right um, shows how we understand as geologists and volcanologists the systems work. So from depth, the magma comes up beneath the caldera, and then it shoots out fairly shallowly in the subsurface along what we call rift zones. So when it comes to prospecting, especially in the older volcanoes and the young volcanoes, um, we wanna look where we think there's intrusive magma and the most obvious place to look is in the caldera and rift zone regions. So Puna Geothermal Venture exists at Kil along Kilauea's East Rift Zone, which is the most active volcanically rift of the most active volcano. So it's kind of obvious as the first place to look. And as I'll get into, that's where most geothermal prospecting in the state has been done. So how do we conduct geothermal prospecting in Hawaii? The kind of methodology that my group has inherited from the initial prospecting that was done in the 1970s is to first look at groundwater data from existing water wells. So there are pukas or holes in the ground across the state, and we can get information from those. After that, we can do geophysical surveys where we put instruments on the surface, and that gives us information about the subsurface. And really, to, to validate or confirm the presence of a resource, we need to drill, it, drill into it and measure the temperature. And um, we advocate for drilling slim holes first. They're three to five inches in diameter, um, so very small environmental footprint, as you can see by this image, that was a drilling project that we did on Lanai a few years back. The drill rig is actually hidden behind um, one of the, the containers there. And we really just need a couple of acres and a crew of about 10 people to get one of these uh, wells dug. However, it's quite expensive. So um, part of the rationale be behind this methodology is to go from cheapest to most expensive. And um, every time we learn about the subsurface, there's a connection into fresh groundwater, which is also of importance to the state, as well as carbon storage potential. So Scott mentioned carbon capture, um, and then we want to put it into the ground, but we need to make sure that if we do that, we do it safely. So we really need to understand the characteristics of the subsurface and the deep subsurface, because <laughs> our geothermal resource is deep, and we want to inject the carbon dioxide deeply. Um, and we have limited data on our deep subsurface statewide. So I'll now talk about a statewide geothermal resource assessment that I led from 2014 to 2021. It was conducted over three phases and funded by the Department of Energy, a total $2.3 million. Um, and what I'm showing here is kind of a teaser. This is our final probability map. And we decided in the end to focus on just the probability of subsurface heat. Um, not fluid because we have fluid in the state, we're an island environment, and permeability is another quality of the subsurface that's important for traditional geothermal development, but we just lack data on the subsurface permeability. So we kind of decided at the end of this project to concentrate just on subsurface heat. Uh, and in this map, the 
warmer colors are higher probability. So um, right away, you can see that like the reds are the calderon rift zones of the two active volcanoes um, in the state, Mauna Loa and, and Kilauea. But you also see some reds, for example, on Oahu and even on Kauai, because um, the water data that we have makes looks it, it makes it appear that there may be a resource, but we really need more information to know. Um, so how did we get to this map? So I'll kind of quickly run you through what we did for this project. Um, in step one or phase one, we were only allowed to do a desktop study, not to go out and get new information. Um, so we identified, aggregated, and then ranked existing data types relevant to subsurface heat, fluid, and permeability. That's what the Department of Energy asked us to do in phase one. And they're grouped, color-coded um, by geological data types geological, geophysical data types in red, and then groundwater data in blue. Um, we also looked at Hawaiian place names, which I'll show here. It's this image um, in the middle bottom. Because Hawaiian place names are descriptive, and so, for example, something like a rotten egg smell could tell us something about um, what Native Hawaiians observed in the past when they were generating the place names. So top left, um, I'm showing groundwater temperatures. So that data is publicly available from existing wells, so we plotted that up. What you see on the right is just geologic data from a geologic map that's published. And on top of that, superimposed gravity, which is a geophysical data type that tells us about the density of rock in the subsurface. And in Hawaii, we want dense rock, um, which is, signifies intrusive magma. Um, we also did math, so we developed a statistical, a statistical approach to integrate all those data types I showed you into a probability map. I'm not going to go into this, but in phase one, we did plot the probability of heat, permeability, and fluid, and used a product rule to get to resource probability. Once we moved into phase three, we decided, you know, our fluid is pretty equal to one at resource steps, and we don't have enough information on permeability at resource steps to really use that information into our mapping um, statewide. So phase two, we were allowed to go out and gather new groundwater and geophysical data. Um, we acquired groundwater data statewide. Um, we concentrated our geophysics on the island of Lanai and a little bit on Maui. On Maui, the terrain made it more challenging and a little bit of geophysics on Big Island. I'm not showing that results here, but it's published. So you could reach out to me, I could send you the publications. Um, and then in phase three, we were tasked with drilling to uh, attempt to validate what our mapping had done in the prior stages. And so we went to Lanai, um, where there was already a 1500 foot deep water well not in use, and we were able to deepen through that. Um, and what I'm showing here, so again, it's, an, it's the photo of the drill setup. And on the left, this is a temperature depth plot. So to get to geothermal, we want these warmer temperatures and um, we're going down in the earth. Uh, as we go down on this plot, and Lanai is in green. The wells that were drilled into Kilauea's East Rift Zone are in red, so super volcanically active and hot. And then other wells that were drilled um, in the state, deep wells, are in the blues. And so I hope what you can see is that for the depth that we got to on Lanai, we're kind of pretty exciting. Like we're right in that range of temperature values that were measured even in Kilauea's East Rift Zone. And this also shows why we really wanted to get deeper because it's not until like below one kilometer, um, a thousand meters on this plot that the, the temperature gradients increased um, quite substantially, even within Kilauea's East, East Rift Zone. So on Lanai, the drilling was funding limited. Um, we didn't get to choose our site. We, we deepened an existing water well that was pretty close to where we would have gone. We didn't get deep enough, um, but we still appear to be onto something. And it's really these results that have me personally excited about the potential on Oahu, um, which Scott mentioned, which is where the energy load really is. Uh, on Oahu, we can't, um, well, our tests so far have shown that, that one key geophysical method we use is not successful. It's an electromagnetic method and there's too much EM noise uh, on Oahu where we have more infrastructure. So I, I advocate for just drilling some slim holes on Oahu and measuring what the temperature is. I, and I, Scott mentioned education as well. I just wanted to mention that in that research project on Lanai, we made a concerted effort to involve the community. Um, so several publications on the project were involved. We had community meetings and we hosted an open house where the community could come um, 
see the drilling in action with caution tape around it and look at some of the core and look at the drilling fluids. And I think that went a long way to um, gain trust of the Lanai community, who I think in the end mostly supported our project. Um, I'm going to end by reviewing where we are in the state in terms of data collection, th those three steps I mentioned. And we've looked really fairly comprehensively at groundwater statewide. Um, through UH, we're starting to get a handle on, on the geophysics, particularly for Big Island and Lanai. Um, like to do some geophysics on some of the other islands as well. Um, and in fact, it's these data types that pretty much went into our final probability of heat map. Um, we also have a confidence, calculated a confidence in the probability. And of course, our confidence goes up the more data types we have, right? Um, where are we in terms of drilling data, that deep drilling data? Well, we're, we're bad. And that's why I say I advocate for drilling more of those slim holes. So where drilling has been done is along Kilauea's East Drift Zone. So that's what's in the bottom right. Um, the yellow dots are geothermal exploration wells, largely drilled in the 1970s. And then the stars on this map of Hawaii Island show some locations where other drilling has been conducted. And then I, I think it's true to say that the drilling that my project did on Lanai a few year, years back is the deepest well now off of Hawaii Island. So that was the first attempt to get heat data off of Hawaii Island. And again, it looks good, so that's encouraging. Um, when I think what we need to do if we want to understand what our resource and geothermal resource in the state looks like is to drill more of those slim holes. And people ask me, how much money would you want? <laughs> they, I, you know, 20, 50, 100 million um, would enable us to, I think, very well understand where our geothermal prospects are across the state. Um, that sounds like a lot of money, but we spend billions per year importing money. I mean, importing the fossil fuels. So is it really that much money? And then also people say, where would you start? What island? What volcano? Um, and those are discussions that can be had if there was funding <laughs> to move this forward. Um, I was going to show the final map one more time. So we're excited about the reds even off of Hawaii Island. And, and clearly, there's more potential, we think, on Hawaii Island on, on even some of the older volcanoes. Um, perspective, California has 2,700 plus megawatts of geothermal online with a call to get another gigawatt online within a few years. Iceland's at 755, but I believe they're almost 100% renewable. And Hawaii, we're at 38. I'd, I'd really love to see this number get bigger. Um, and again, it's going to take money. It's going to take work. It's going to take several years, but I think we're capable of doing it and we should do it. And I'll end there. Nicole, thank you very much. And just to remind the listeners, it, for a one of those larger drilling projects, it costs anywhere from one to $3 million, is that correct? Two to $3 million, yeah. And I think actually, if we could get a drilling program going, we could have increased efficiencies that would enable us to decrease the price a little bit. Um, but I think you need insurance with drilling because you're never quite sure how it's gonna go. Paul can probably okay. say that as well. So I like to say 3 million per well. And, and I think I see Paul, you might want to give comment when we get to him next about how, how much drilling might cost. But Nicole, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I just wanted to address a quick question that we received through the question box. Uh, for those who are asking where they can find these slides, uh, we are recording this webinar and it will be up on Western Governors uh, uh, Association's YouTube as well as social media. So you'll be able to find this presentation uh, after the webinar ends. Uh, next, we have Paul Thompson with ORMAT Technologies. He's Vice President of Business Development. ORMAT Technology uh, own, owns and operates Puna Geothermal Venture, which we had the opportunity to tour when we are out in Hawaii. Paul, could you give us an overview of what PGV is, kind of the history of it, and where it's going? Absolutely. So thank you all for uh, having me today. I want to thank uh, the Western Governors Association and Governor Polis for focusing on geothermal. Um, and by way of introduction, I am the Vice President of Business Development, um, but I, I'm kind of a unicorn in the fact that I've bounced between the private sector and the public sector. So I've also served as Chairman of the Public Utilities Commission in Nevada um, and the Governor's Energy Advisor for the state of Nevada. Um, I've also worked for the federal government for United States Senators Richard Bryan and Harry Reid. 
Um, so the policy discussion I hope that we have later will be near and dear to my heart. Um, but let's talk briefly about ORMAT. So ORMAT Technologies um, is a publicly traded company on the New York Stock Exchange. You can find us under the ticker ORA. And we have developed, we design and manufacture equipment and we also own and operate power plants. So today we own and operate over a thousand megawatts of geothermal facilities throughout the world. We've also been responsible for developing an additional 2000 megawatts of power plants in 31 countries around the world. Um, I think it's exciting to see a lot of the new discussions around geothermal. And um, you know, we, we kind of like to focus people that geothermal has been around for a long time. And it has you know, provided incredible benefits. And so it's very exciting to see this discussion and I'm thrilled to be here. Um, Puna Geothermal Venture was uh, developed in 1993. It was really one of, I think the first geothermal project, well, the geysers in California is about 50 years old, um, but PGV was the first of its kind on a volcanic resource in the US. Um, ORMAT uh, acquired PGV in 2004 and invested about $32 million in additional equipment to kind of upgrade Pune Geothermal Venture to be a state-of-the-art uh, facility. What is unique about Pune Geothermal Venture is it was one of the few places, or the first places in the world where we had a combined cycle geothermal power plant. And many of you listening have maybe heard of combined cycle natural gas facilities, but what was done at PGV is we took the flash resource, this, this superheated steam that was coming out under pressure, and we also used its heat through a binary process. So we had both a flash component and a binary component to help generate the 38 megawatts of geothermal power at PGV. Uh, 38 megawatts, as you heard from Scott and Nicole on the Big Island, doesn't consume a lot of power. So that was at one point about 30% of the Big Island's power came from geothermal energy. And the recent eruptions in 2018, <clears throat> Uh, Nicole's chart you saw, there is incredible geothermal potential on the Big Island. And it was once thought to really be limited by how do we get it to other islands. And I think Scott did a fantastic job of outlining, you know, the ability to use it for direct air capture, to use it for um, green hydrogen and the electrolysis process and using that energy with zero emissions. And also directly, the one I would add to that um, is electric vehicles. Um, throughout the West, we're seeing a lot of initiatives to uh, create electric highways. I did this at the state office in Nevada. And the Big Island, for example, you know, a huge amount of the cars are rental cars for tourists and so forth. And if they were all electric, using that electric grid, you could maybe take a big whack at those emissions from automobiles um, on the island. So, the potential is incredible. And so, um, you know, we are excited. We, we provided a tour of this, this asset. And as many of you may have seen, and if you haven't, go to YouTube and check out ORMAT's site or any Hawaii volcanic eruption. Um, the recent eruptions really came directly around our facility. It actually completely surrounded the Pune Geothermal Venture that was built on a previous uh, caldera. So we were kind of a higher elevation. Um, and it really proved the resiliency of geothermal projects. When we find this resource thousands of feet below our feet, um, you know, a volcanic eruption, ash, lava coming over it, doesn't decimate that incredible resource. And at PGV, we proved that. We were able to cover up wells. We had an emergency response plan. Um, the lava inundated, you know, came over some of those wells. It didn't actually touch the power plant. And we were able to drill back, clear that lava, look at those wells, um, you know, fix them for lack of a technical term, and start using them again for injection and production from that resource. Um, and we've had to do a lot of work that we didn't expect kind of on those, you know, how to get those wells back and performing the way we wanted them to. But we're incredibly excited to see that things have gotten hotter. The rift is, uh, you know, still producing this incredible resource below Hawaii's feet. Um, and that's the same whether you're in California. You know, California has a slightly different resource, but there's incredible geothermal potential. Nevada, we operate projects in Idaho, um, Utah, 
you name it, there's probably been a geothermal project there that ORMAT has um, uh, been a part of. So I'm happy to kind of answer any questions moving forward about PGV. From the contract perspective, as Scott talked about, since its inception in 1993, the energy from Pune Geothermal Venture has enabled the, the displacement of about 14 million gallons of oil. Because geothermal is what I like to call firmly flexible, we provide power 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, that could supplant these oil-driven power plants, which are hard to find in most places in the world, but we're quite prominent um, in Hawaii. But they can do the same for coal facilities in the West, reductions in natural gas facilities. If you're looking for a capacity resource, there's nothing better um, than geothermal. And so we are trying to expand that resource. We are also renegotiating the power purchase agreement. Um, and that is when it was originally negotiated decades ago, it was linked to the price of oil. So as the price of oil went up, our avoided cost in the contract went up and we get paid more. Our proposal to the Public Utilities Commission in 2019 was to decouple the price from oil and to offer a flat energy rate and capacity rate. The energy rate that's uh, before the Public Utilities Commission today is about 5.7 cents. I want that to sink in. Most Western states are paying nine to 12 cents for power. We're about half that. In Hawaii, they're seeing rates as high as 20 cents per kilowatt hour. So geothermal has the ability to save ratepayers in Hawaii $60 million a year in the price of energy. That is why we are seeing more and more people talking about geothermal to provide a carbon-free capacity resource. And we, were, we are willing to lock in that price for 30 years and continue to operate that project and look for continued expansion on the big island. Moving to the policy discussion, you know, how do we do more geothermal development? Um, I think Nicole hit on it. We need to drill more wells. We need to find more resources. And that typically comes down to the cost and permitting. In the lower 48, permitting takes place on federal lands. We are seeing a very slow NEPA process. It takes about two years to permit an exploration well. It takes about another two years to permit the power plant itself. Um, so when you look at trying to meet California's aggressive uh, objective of bringing on a thousand megawatts of geothermal by 2026. I hope you started a year or two ago. Um, the Biden administration has just come out and said, look, we have to streamline permitting. If we're gonna meet our renewable goals, we have to do it quicker. Um, and the magic is always, well, how do you do that? Uh, and in my 16 years at ORMAT, the, the most, you know, I think simple solution was make the permitting of renewable projects part of the permitting agency's KPIs, their, their key performance indicators. Meaning BLM for a hundred years or 50 said, oil and gas, oil and gas, it was a priority and po people focused on how many oil and gas wells were drilled. We need to do the same for geothermal. We need to make it transparent and we don't need to tell those offices how to, you know, whether to approve or not, but to make the decisions to say, look, this is an area we shouldn't develop a project. This is an area we should. It would reduce the time we spend, you know, permitting projects for years that may not go anywhere because there's an endangered species or, you know, a tribal concern. But as long as that's part of their KPIs, that has been the biggest, has had the biggest impact on federal permitting and on state permitting in places like Nevada. Um, the RPS discussion that uh, Scott brought up has also been, it's not by coincidence, we typically operate power plants in states with a renewable portfolio standard. And as we've seen, as you see higher and higher penetration levels for renewables, you need more and more geothermal. Solar or wind are phenomenal resources, but they're intermittent. And California is a great example. We saw over 20 gigawatts of solar deployed. It's an astonishing number over the last decade. But then the solar isn't performing, whether it's smoke from wildfires or cloudy days. Um, the wind is struggling because there's a heat wave and the typical convection currents aren't moving the windmills and they have blackouts and brownouts because capacity wasn't accounted for. And that's where geothermal comes in to provide 
capacity or what people call resource adequacy when those other resources can. So they need to work hand in hand. And as you try to achieve incredible goals like Hawaii wants to do 100% by 2045, you need to look at firm, flexible, carbon-free resources. And when you start doing that, it's geothermal, geothermal, geothermal. And so I think a lot of Western states can learn from some of these examples of first movers like California and say, look, we need to balance the portfolio and make sure we don't forget about the need for capacity. When you back out a coal plant, when you back out a natural gas plant, what's gonna be there when you need power and it's the middle of the night and the wind isn't blowing? Um, and, and we've seen, you know, just to say it's real, we're not just talking about something that's kind of uh, theoretical. ORMAT alone has signed 125 megawatts worth of power purchase agreements in California this year. We signed another 130 or about 160 megawatts of contracts in Nevada. The Western Interconnect is seeing this need grow and grow. And it brings us back to, I think, the goal of drilling deeper, drilling quicker, finding these resources, being able to permit them, bring them to fruition quicker. Um, and the results are just incredible. The ability to have and zero emissions, the new binary equipment uh, is reviewed by the California Air Resources Board is having zero emissions, being firmly flexible um, and providing these attributes that are just uh, unparalleled. So I'm happy to answer questions. I'm, we're excited to continue to expand our development and looking at Hawaii. Um, and I think, you know, Hawaii has just been, I'll finish with Hawaii because I think it has been kind of at the, the forward tip of this discussion and it can do incredible things because of these resources to try to move to make the renewable power part of its baseload, relegate fossil fuels to be part of its peaking, and then figure out how to do away with it with innovations like direct air capture, green hydrogen, electric vehicles, etc. So, thank you all. Well, thank you very much for that perspective. Uh, we've gotten some great questions and I'm going to try to run through as many as we can. The first one excuse me, goes to Scott. Uh, and Scott, the question is, how much interaction do you have with DOD on developing renewable energy options, given the large presence of military in Hawaii? And I will extend that to other federal agencies as well, because in our work session, that got brought up quite a bit. Thanks um, for the question. You know, DND, DOD has been um, an important partner in Hawaii on our renewable energy goals. Marine Corps Base Hawaii has been testing tidal power, wave power for a long time. Um, we just opened a, we just did a groundbreaking ceremony for a solar plus battery storage project at Joint Base Pearl Harbor. Um, Joint Base is also where we have a hydrogen fueling station that the Air Force uses for some of their on-base hydrogen uh, fueled equipment. So there's a number of ways that we work with the DOD on renewable energy. Um, for geothermal potential, um, there's nothing currently um, happening. However, uh, looking at the maps that Nicole shared, several of those red spots are underneath lands that are currently either leased or to the DOD or are reserved by the federal government for DOD use. And so there's, there's opportunities for discussion there and some dialogue has happened. And, and I'll just follow up and say, you know, DOD has, has looked at geothermal. For those of for your listeners who don't know, you know, one of the largest geothermal projects uh, in the United States is operated by the Navy uh, at COSO in Southern California. So they have experience um, and there is room for really innovative projects. Uh, ORMAT has done some projects at the Rocky, the Strategic Oil Reserve at Rocky Mountain Oil Test Center using uh, heat from uh, oil and gas wells to produce additional uh, electricity with no new emissions. Um, and those land resources, I think the DOD uh, through the Navy would be very interested in uh, expanding. The conversations we've had is they want to find secure domestic sources for energy. And if you can find geothermal, there's really no better secure domestic resource. Wonderful. We have a question from Stanley Osserman. Uh, and his question is, could modern directional deep drilling be used to generate geothermal power safely in Hawaii onshore and even offshore by drilling deeper than one kilometer? And I think Paul and Nicole, you guys might be uh, some of the experts on uh, modern directional drilling. 
So I'm looking up one kilometer is how many feet? 3,000 ish. 3,000 ish. So I think uh, my short answer, and I am, I am not an expert, um, is the answer is yes. We have directionally drilled for years in the geothermal sector. Um, and the wells uh, on the Big Island are much deeper than 3,000 feet. I think they, some of them are five to 6,000 feet in depth. Um, but the question is, the current discussion on directional drilling, um, there's a large scope, meaning some people want to um, create kind of underground closed loop systems with directional drilling that kicks off at a, you know, a 90 degree angle and reconnects and so forth. And that's going to be part of kind of the new enhanced or advanced geothermal um, design. But basic directional kind of kicking off in different directions from the same post has been done for geothermal projects very successfully um, in Reno as our steamboat project and other geothermal projects around the world. Uh, the one limitation for any technical folks is we typically use down well pumps. Um, it may, uh, sorry, we use a pump shaft above surface with a pump down. So it kind of limits your ability to turn um, unless we have some innovation in pump design to allow them to make uh, shafts that can turn pretty aggressively. Awesome. I have two questions that kind of ask the same. Uh, one is from Patrick Dobson and one's from Alan. Uh, they both ask, uh, uh, can you, so Patrick asked, can you elaborate on Puna's uh, ability to do flexible power generation. Uh, and Alan asked, how quickly can geothermal electricity generation ramp up and down to compensate for sudden changes, changes in solar and wind? Man, it's, it's, like, it's like they were planted to ask the perfect question. Uh, so the binary design, and I don't have a diagram of this for you, but we basically, we heat a secondary working fluid, which vaporizes and turns a turbine. We then take the vapor out of the backside of the turbine, we cool it back down and inject it back into the geothermal reservoir so there's no emissions. We can simply add a bypass valve. So once the working fluid flashes, instead of going across the turbine, it goes to the air coolers, it cools back down, goes into the reservoir. We don't lose any geothermal brine because it's in its closed loop system. The working fluid cools back down, goes back in to vaporize again and it allows us to um, ramp the power plant up and down faster than a combined cycle natural gas plant. And one of the first places we did that was at Puna Geothermal Venture. We provided the option for Helco to run it in what we call AGC or automatic grid control. And they can ramp the power plant up as needed. Um, and it wasn't, it, at the time it was, they didn't have a huge load in the evenings. So they would curtail us um, which could be another option for using that excess energy for hydrogen or direct air capture. Um, and then when loads increased, they can ramp us up and current state-of-the-art binary technology today, because we're not uh, having to heat something, we're simply opening and closing a valve. We can provide uh, VAR support and all of the kind of ranges of ancillary ramping benefits uh, because we can do it so quickly. Wonderful. Uh, and we had a question that was actually emailed uh, beforehand. Let me pull that up really quickly. Uh, the question is, uh, many states have upgraded their public data access related to geothermal or encouraged data acquisition to help the industry grow the small pool of steady, sustainable jobs it is famous for. Can you speak to any initiatives in the area of uh, geothermal data and things of that nature? Um, I guess maybe I'll take a stab at that as the, as the state. Um, we were directed by the state legislature to become an energy data clearinghouse. And we'll be um, rolling out some data capabilities here over the next few weeks and months um, through our website. Uh, at this point, geothermal data is not um, part of our initial rollout of data that we'll be releasing, but um, as we build out our data sets, we'll be looking to add more and more information around geothermal. So stay tuned, I guess, is maybe the short answer for that. And I can say that all the data from the Play Fairway project that I described is uploaded to the Federal Geothermal Data Repository. Um, 
And the research group I founded called Hawaii Groundwater and Geothermal Resources Center has a website that hosts much of the groundwater data in the state. Um, so if you poke around that website, uh, I think under project is, or, or maybe it's under repository that says Hawaii Water Wells. And um, I point people to that fairly frequently who are very excited to see that that page exists. And I awesome. think similar resources uh, exist in other states. So I think um, uh, in Nevada, we have the Great Basin Geothermal Center as part of the University of Nevada system that has compiled a lot of that uh, core sampling data from the mining industry and from the geothermal sector as well. Um, and it used to be called Sea Dogger. It was the California Division of Oil, Gas and Geothermal Resources. They have a new name. They compile a lot of that data as well um and make it all publicly available wonderful well scott paul and nicole thank you guys very much for joining us to, for today's webinar uh, to talk about the amazing resources in hawaii and the geothermal potential there uh, i would like to once again extend a very special thank you to governor david Ige for inviting the wga to come out to hawaii and thank you for everybody who tuned in today uh, if you wanted to review anything that was said today or looking at any of the slides western governors will have this up on our social media channels as well as our youtube page for you to view at a later time make sure to join us next time on the heat beneath our feet webinar when we discuss the oldest and largest geothermal heating and cooling district in America. Once again, thank you and have a great day.